Uh, Genesis chapter 1, turn there. Good to, good to see you out today. Nice, beautiful day. You could have been out at the lake, not catching fish like I would. And um, or out mowing the grass or going to flea markets or whatever. She came to the house of the Lord, and I appreciate it. Appreciate her visitors from the great nation, or the state, actually, of Cedar Hill, Missouri. Y'all just ain't too far from my house. B Highway. I live on B Highway. Uh oh. They're neighbors. Well, Genesis chapter 1. Um, pray for our conference coming up this week. Pastor Cooley. Supposed to be here tomorrow, so pray for traveling safety for him. And uh, Brother Reg Kelly is going to be with us Thursday, so I've made contact with him. And I'll probably get a chance to talk to him tomorrow. So just pray for these men and uh, pray for our conference. And, um, you know, just, just to be able to do our part to promote the Bible, promote the liberty that we have in our country to preach this Bible. Those are important. This is the last place here. It all ends here in America. And other countries are already uh, having their liberties retracted from them. Their ability to say what needs to be said, to preach what needs to be preached, do it in love. But... Um, so who knows how long that will last in our country. So let's, uh, let's do our part. Amen. Genesis chapter 1. Uh, let's uh, read what happens on day 2 and day 3. Because I want to get into both tonight. Now I've got some neat things. I, I've read Genesis 1, I don't know how many times. And, it, and it's true. You, the more you look, the more you find things you never saw before. And that's the case with with the study tonight, uh, w when I go to the Bible and I say, I've already got that one figured out, or I already know what there is to know about that, don't do that. God will shut it off. But just say, God, there's something else here. Show it to me. You know, in time, God will do it. So, and it's, it's just neat that way. Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 6. God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. God made the firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. God called the firmament heaven. The evening and the morning were the second day. So the second day is division. God follows an order and a pattern here. And that pattern, he's establishing dividing things. So we'll read the verse up on the screen here a little bit, just as a reminder. It's been a couple weeks since we were, we're back to this. So I'm just going to kind of remind you, and we'll move into day three, but let's read day three, starting in verse nine. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. Now there's a pattern in this passage right here. There's a pattern of the number three in this passage. Okay, and I'll show it to you. And then there's another one. Verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the uh, tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Now, Father, we come before you tonight. We ask, Lord, your blessings upon your word and uh, upon our church. And, Lord, the, the faithful ministry that you have given into our hands. We thank you, God, that these visitors came to be with us tonight because they came because of the ministry you've given us. So, Father, I hope that tonight they receive a blessing. And, Lord, help us to receive a blessing from them. But, Father, your name be praised, but your word magnified even above your name. And Father, just guide us and go with us and uh, open our eyes and help us to see wondrous things from thy word. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now, in that he divided the heaven and the earth. I'm just going to touch on this very quick and then I'm going to move in to day three. 
But there's always a sim symbolism to what God does. There's the real. We know that God really did this. We know that God really took the waters that were above the firmament, separated them from the waters above the firmament. The firmament is the expanse of the sky. And, and we can, you can know that because in, um, in verse 20 of chapter 1, he talks about, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. So the firmament is not, as the flat earth people say, this hard candy coated shell over the earth. It is an open expanse. It's what the meaning of it is. And God describes that there in verse 20. It's open. It's wide. It's big. So there is the, uh, I think I have a picture, screen of, picture of it here. Hang on. The first heaven is above the earth. That's the sky, the fowls of the air fly in that heaven. And notice that there's clouds there. That's the waters above. And the waters down here on the earth are the waters below. So that is separated. There's actually a line that science knows about that actually separate. It's the very end of the earth's atmosphere. It's the edge of it. And Neil Armstrong, this really happened. You saw it in the movie First Man if you watched that movie. But this really happened. Neil Armstrong flying an experimental jet bounced off the dome of the heaven. Bounced off of it. And wasn't sure how he was going to get back in because he's piloting this test plane that it took him up above. I can't remember the name of that line. Took him up above that line. So he's going into space. He's weightless. So he tries to get, he, his stick doesn't work because there's no air to maneuver his plane with. But it's got jets on it. It's got little rockets on it. So he fires the ro rockets and ratchets that thing sideways and literally cuts like a knife down in, back into the atmosphere so he can come back down again. So anyway, that, but that's the first heaven. Second heaven is bigger than the first heaven. Huge. Monstrous. I hate to use that word, but I mean, it is absolutely huge. And that's biblical. The third heaven is actually larger than the second and the first heaven. Okay? I don't know how much larger. I just know that it's larger. Okay? So the meaning of that, the, uh, I'll get into this and then we'll move on. Isaiah 55. Turn your Bible there. Look up on the screen. Seek the Lord. While he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. And I want you to think about that. God is in the third heaven. God's in the third heaven. We're sending radio signals out into space. And we've barely gotten anywhere with it. And yet, when we pray, God is as near to us as hearing even the thoughts that are in our mind. Okay, that's a good God. Amen. He's not, even though that's where he resides, his spirit is here with us. And God hears us when we whisper a prayer. So God says in verse eight, let me move to that. From my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your ways. Thoughts. That, that, I'm put that back up on the screen. Okay? As far away as the third heaven is from where you're sitting right now, that's how much higher God is. He is the most... There's not... Oh, watch this now. There's not a fourth heaven above the third heaven. There's not a God... That sits above our God. Is that what we believe? Or are we Mormons? That believe that we got our planet and our God. But our God came from another planet who had his God. And I don't know who the God is above all the other gods. I just know the Bible says that my God is the God above all gods. Amen. So God said my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. There are things that happen that I do not understand. I, and I'm, sometimes I get a little fleshly with God. Cause that's, I mean, it's my nature. It's just how we are. We, there are things that happen 
And we don't understand why they happen this way. And it's easy for us to think that maybe God isn't going to answer our prayers. Or God isn't going to treat us good. Or God just too far away to hear us. Or God cannot do something. But we don't understand what God understands and we don't see what God sees. God, according, this is why we have a Bible, why we believe it the way we do. God says in this book that his thoughts are on us all the time. God never stops thinking about you. God never, God has never, ever directed your path into an evil way to bring you down. Except for when he's going to chastise you, then he's going to bring you back out. Okay? That's the absolute trust that we can have on God. And I'm, every time I run into a situation in life where I'm not happy with the results of how something turned out, I have to remind myself that God still is in this thing and God's not done. Amen? God's not done. Uh, look at this. Isaiah 40 verse 12 who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heaven with the span. The span, when they measured things, you, everybody carried around their tape measure, Chris. Here's their tape measure. Cubit, from elbow to tip of finger, span, from wrist to tip of finger. Now, when I was young and thin, believe it or not, I used to crawl in attics and blow in insulation. And the type of insulation that we blew in, an R30 insulation in, a, in an attic was eight inches of blown in material. Well, it just so happens that from here to here is eight inches. So if I'd be up in an attic and I'd be blowing the attic, I'd stick my hand straight down in that insulation. And if the insulation went up past my wrist, I knew that they got eight inches. And every time I'd blow a little bit, I'd stick my hand down there and make sure you got enough in there. Because that's what they're paying for. They're paying for eight inches. So you give them eight inches. That's how we measured it. So God's measurement here is a span. That's what the Bible's talking about here in this verse. He meted out heaven with the span. In other words, one span with God measures the whole universe. One span. How big is God? When we sing that song, he's got the whole world in his hands. That is shortchanging God. He got the whole heaven in his hand. He's got the whole heaven. He, every, he said he meted out. Meted means measured. He used, you might say God used a metric system. I'm not sure about that, but anyway. He meted out heaven with the span, comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure. The dust of the earth. Think about it. How many dust particles are there in this world? He's measured them all out and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. How in the world do you, how do you weigh a mountain? How much does a mountain weigh? And God weighs them. God weighs, them. that's what it says. He's weighed out the mountains in scales. He's got them all figured out. So, since God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts, since we know that the entire universe can fit in one hand of God, since we know that he's counted every dust particle in this earth, and we know that he's weighed every mountain everywhere. There's mountains on the moon, there's mountains on Mars, there's mountains everywhere that we can tell, and God has them all weighed. He knows the exact figure of every mountain everywhere in his creation. So who's the smartest? You or God? Of course he is. He's, he's a genius. Because if, let's just say that scientists got together and they, they guesstimated based upon the density of the rock and the size of Mount Everest, that they took a guess and they measured out and weighed what they thought Mount Everest would weigh. They'd write that down in a book somewhere. We'd have to go look it up to find out the answer. God just knows it. He knows it. God knows your thoughts, my thoughts. We're studying this on Wednesday night. God knows everything that there is to know. And there's a verse that I added 
to that teaching will come out Wednesday where God even has all of the thoughts about you numbered. The amount of thoughts that God has just pertaining to you is absolutely amazing. And yet God then has done that with every individual that's ever arrived on earth or ever will. I'd say God's going to win the contest. Amen? Now turn to Genesis 1 again. God, God is an ordered God. Everything that He's done in these first two days, He has laid out a plan and order. So I'm going to throw this in along with all this other thing that we're talking about. When a person is saved, the Bible says they are a new creature. The word creature derives from the word created. They are a new creation. Now God changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. So when God makes a, when God creates a new Christian, a new saint, he follows the same order in bringing a sinner to salvation as he did in Genesis. You're going to find the gospel in Genesis 1. So just very briefly, let's cover the first two days of creation. Number one, when God, this is when God's going to save, when God's going to save John. God, first of all, created John, but he created him a mess. Right so far? He was without form and void. The Bible talks about people are void of understanding. They're void of knowing things. Okay? And if you would ask him two questions about God, he wouldn't be able to answer two of three of them. Okay? He was void. But the Spirit of God began to move in his life. Does that sound familiar to you? This is how God saved you. Okay? And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. So now you're a mess, but God's spirit is moving. God's light now is shining in your soul. And all of a sudden, because I'm telling you, nobody, nobody is saved without the light. Nobody is. You don't, you don't think original thoughts and learn something from God without God turning the light on in your mind. If you've ever been studying or reading or just thinking random thoughts and all of a sudden, boom, God slams something into your mind about something in the Bible you read two weeks ago or a month ago, that was God saying, let there be light. Click. So now, all of a sudden, you probably at some point in your, in your salvation road, God turned a light on. You went immediately from darkness to light. You didn't know what light that was, but you knew it was something. And then God showed you the separation between light and darkness. He showed you that you were in darkness and he's in the light. And what he's wanting to do is bring you to the light. So that's day one. The second day of creation is what we find here in day two. God separated. Because most people in this world who are not saved and never will be saved do not believe that they need salvation. They either believe that they, there is no God, there is no heaven, that everything about my existence is right here on this earth, so they have no difference in their mind between heaven and earth. Or, or they think that they, by their good deeds or their religion or whatever, they're going to make it automatically to heaven. In other words, live your life how you want to down here. It doesn't matter. You're still going to heaven. But what God did in your life and in your mind was immediately separate him from you. And he let you know you're way down here and I'm way up here and I'm the boss. I'm in charge, and if you want eternal life, you have to recognize that you are not me. You're not me, because we're separated. So that's a sinner's life so far, but God's working in them. Now, day three, God's going to add something to that. So he said, God said, let the waters under the heaven... Be gathered together in one place, 
Let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth into gathering together the waters he called seas. So let's stop. And God saw that it was good. So let's stop right here. Day one, God does one thing. Day two, God does two things. Day three, the number three is all in this thing. Notice that in verse nine, you have uh, heaven mentioned. Let the waters under the heaven be gathered. You have heaven mentioned. And then later on, you have earth mentioned. And then later on, you have the seas mentioned. Does everybody get that in your mind? How many is that? It's three. You have the heaven, you have the earth, and you have the seas. Now think about, think about dimensions. Heaven above, earth here, and the seas are the depths or the deep. So one, two, three. God is display, and by the way, we believe that there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So God, in Romans, and I'll read this verse in a minute, but God said in Romans chapter 1 that even His eternal, eternal power and Godhead can be seen in the creation. Well, right here, on day three, you're seeing the Godhead. Heaven, earth, sea. Three things. Then, look at verse 11. Man, I like this. In fact, I'm going to get my little, these kids like it when I get my little red pen out. I'm fixing to draw now, guys. Now watch this. God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. How many things? Three. Grass, seed, fruit tree. Very good, Hope. Grass. Now your mom's going to ask you this on a test this week. What three things did God make on day three? Grass, herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. Now watch this. The number three. Think about this number. When I say the number three, what pops out in your mind from the Bible about the number three? We mentioned already. Who, what? The, the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Okay, so that's part of it. God said, watch this now. God said, Jesus said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One, two, three. And right after that, when Jesus quoted that, he said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus said, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. Abraham, now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their bodies were already put in, a, in the tomb in the cave of Machpelah. And yet, Jesus described them as being yet alive. Their soul was still alive in Abraham's bosom at that time. Then he set captivity free and now they're in paradise. But God is the God. That's why he said Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. One, two, three. The number three is a number relating to life. So think about this. He created trees in the Bible. Name two famous trees in the Bible. Tree of Life. This is about life. And God displays and creates. I mean, think about it. The first two days of creation, God's just dealing with the physics of the universe. Setting up the ability for there to be life. But on day one and day two, God has not created any life yet. But on day three, He did. Because three represents life. It represents resurrection. It represents new life. Uh, let me show you this very, very quickly. Look up here on the screen. Young people, look at this. There's three parts here. The embryo, which is what comes out of a seed that grows up in the, out of the ground. The the seed coat or the shell, which is that hard shell around a bean or corn or a husk or anything like that, the peel of an orange or anything like that. And then every, every seed, every, uh, every embryo has got to have something to eat. So God puts food in here for that seed to have life enough to, to draw nutrients from and moisture so that it can live. You can have a seed laying out. I don't know the world record for how long a seed is viable, but I bet you it would be in the thousands of years. 
that you could plant a thousand year old seed in the ground and it's still got enough in it to pop up. Okay? Now you think about, you think about salvation in this deal because this is what God's teaching us. This is what God's doing here. So in, in a seed, there's three parts to it. You think about us. This body that you see right here, this beautiful, amazing looking body. Hey, it's your DNA too, sister. <laughs> Is nothing but the crusty shell of what really abides within. What abides within me was put there by God himself. Planted there in me. Okay? So, and God showed me this. God helped me, I've told this story, but God helped me when my daddy died because I could not preach his funeral. I couldn't do it. But we took him down to Marcus Hill Cemetery down in Enola, Arkansas, next to his mom and dad, next to his grandma and grandpa. And the night before I'm going to preach dad's gravesite ceremony, God gave me the blessing that I needed. He, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goes forth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And I stood at the side of that casket, my hand on that casket, and I said, I'm not burying my dad. I'm planting the seed of what I believe is going to rise up one of these days. Now, again, that seed, that thing can lay in there for a thousand years. God's going to resurrect it. Amen. And that's one of them old school cemeteries where everybody's facing east. It's one of them old country cemeteries. They all get it right, amen. They're going to face east because they know which direction he's coming from, amen. But see, God is all in this thing. God is displaying his eternal power and Godhead in this thing. Because we are spirit, soul, and body. The body, just like the seed coat of a seed, must corrupt off. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat fall into the earth and die... So that seed coat, this body must corrupt off that hard shell around a seed. As soon as you get it in the ground and put a little moisture on it, that moisture hits that thing and it starts corrupting, starts rotting. And if the conditions are just right, 14 days later, you got new life. 14 is multiple of what number? Seven. Okay. So I did a little homework on this thing. I'm, I'm just happy about it. God is introducing the seed of life into this world and the tree of life that everybody who wants to have access to it can have access to it. And the tree of life is Christ. The tree of life is the word of God. And in the new heaven and the new earth, we know the Bible says that God is going to make the tree of life accessible to all for all of eternity. Whereas in the Garden of Eden, it was accessible as long as man did not transgress. But man transgressed because God did not just put the tree of life in the midst of the garden. He put another tree in the midst of the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what God is doing here is he's introducing choice to mankind. Animals, if you throw meat out for cows to eat, Will they eat it? You obviously know a few things about cows. That's all right. I'm, that's, I'm, why I'm, that's why I'm bringing it up. Cows don't look at grain and oats, barley and alfalfa and all that, and then look at some meat, sausages, hamburgers, and go, you know what? I'm changing my mind. I'm tired of eating this stuff I got to grind. I'm going to go after this meat. Cows don't do that. Squirrels don't hunt foxes and kill them and eat them. I wish they'd hunt coyotes. Amen. <laughs> but they don't. Squirrels don't, squirrels don't choose. God gave man a choice. Amen. God gave man a choice. So that's, that's what this thing is all about. Now, uh, back to Genesis chapter one. Look at this. So the three things that God created on day three, grass, herb yielding seed, fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. 
And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. And so there's it, there it is again. Brought forth grass, herb yielding seed after his kind, the tree yielding fruit. God says it again. Whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the third day. Think of a verse in your Bible that uses the phrase third day. Who's got one? What'd you say, Lens? Boom. Okay? He's, t he's giving you a lesson here on how he does things. So we have three... We actually, on day three, we have three, three deals here. We have the heaven, the earth, and the sea. That's one. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the grass seed and the tree. And then he brought forth the grass, the seed, and the fruit, and the fruit tree. So three and three and three. In this same third day. But then, then, you guys have seen me online, right? Have you used our Bible search software? You're going to get a copy before you walk out of here today. I want to show you something. Okay? Look at verse 11. God said, here's the quote right here. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And that's the end of the quote. With that software, you can highlight that exact phrase, the, the thing that God said, the words that came out of his mouth. It just so happens that that exact phrase, I've got it written down here for you, is 27 words. Now, what's the math on that number 27? How does that break down? Three times three times three. How many books are there in the New Testament? 27, exactly. It's because the Old Testament's death. New Testament's life. Three times three times three. Isn't that cool? Amen. So think about this. Here's a man that's been dead in a tomb four days. How does Jesus give him life? He spoke three words. Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Isn't that neat? Listen. This, this is... This is King James Bible week here at Bethel. This Bible is right. It's in order. I mean, look at, look at just this one group of, of sentences here that deal with the third day of creation and all the patterns of three that are in this thing. We've counted three things there, three things there, three things there, 27 words, three times three times three. He talks about seed, which has three parts, which is a picture of the of us, which have three parts, which is a picture of God, because we're created in God's image, and God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. It all connects together to show you that God did this thing, that God wrote the book. Oh man, I'm happy. I don't know about, if you're mad. I'm sorry. Romans chapter one. Underline this in your Bible: For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, clearly seen. Science knows this. There's a commercial on TV, I've seen it recently, where this, they're, they're telling you this idea about the number three, and they said three is a number that just, it just sounds right. We use the number three for multitude of things. Parents in a threatening countdown for children. I'm going to give you the count of... You never say, I'm going to give you the count of eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, you never, count of three. What happens when a man and a woman come together? The two become one. There's three, okay? It's life. Even in the animal kingdom, the male and the female joined together brings forth a child. That's life. It is God's number four life. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Things that are made, including a seed. Even his eternal power and Godhead. Did you know the word Godhead? Is in the King James Bible exactly three times. Three times exactly. First John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. And I like, I like John. I, John's one of my favorite writers in the Bible. The, the way he writes. The uniqueness of John. John is the one who loved to call Jesus the Word. And he'll call him Jesus, but his favorite 
phrase for Jesus was the Word. In the beginning, it, in fact, look at John 1.1. 1, 1. Turn to John 1.1. 1, 1. Tell me what you see. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Three times the word Word is there. Okay? So the Word is what gives life. It is the seed of life. It's the beginning of life. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. There are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These agree in one. The Spirit is third part of the Godhead. Water. What, how do you make water? Three elements. Two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. Blood. These three agree in one. Um, oh, you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna like this. Everybody, everybody sit down and relax. Get calm for a minute. We, here's what we know now. You got to love, and I know this is a wicked world, but you got to love the time we live in. Because we're understanding things now that n our ancestors never understood. We know what DNA is. We know what's in a bean, a corn kernel, a poppy seed. We know what's in everything that is seed. We know what it is. We know that inside that seed is a bundle of words. A book of words called deoxyribonucleic acid. So, Psalm 139, 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And notice that David said, he's talking to God, in thy book, in thy book, all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Da How did David know? This, this verse here is 3,000 years old. How did David know that the thing that formed him in his mother's womb was actually a book? How did David know that? Because mankind did not find that out until the last part of the 20th century, and we've still, now we're, we've gone too far, now we're changing it. But mankind did not find that out until the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, into the year 2000. It was at the, right around the time of the year 2000 that science decided to try to sequence out the human genome. Because here's what they found out. When, when they figured out how DNA was formed and how it worked, their original thinking was that it was just a splattering of different commands that by accident happened to make life. What they found was exactly the opposite. They found such wonderful structure in DNA that when they looked at it, they said, these are words of a book. DNA is actually words of a book because inside DNA you have these four base pairs. This is not a test. I'm just showing you. I'm going to show you the handiwork of God. Adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. The way these connect is like Morse code. A guy sits down and he taps out dots and dashes. And the sequence of those dots and dashes is what, when, when somebody's listening to that, they take each sequence of dots and dashes and they convert that into an individual letter. So, I mean, who knows what SOS is? Dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. If you buy some of these new flashlights and you hit a button, it'll flash out SOS in Morse code. Okay? Uh, Henry Morse was a Bible reader. He was a Bible believer. And isn't it interesting that the sequence of dots and dashes that make up the letters of Morse code are always in threes. Dot, 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 dash, dash, dash. Dot, dot, dot is S. Dash, dash, dash is O. Dot, dot, dot is 
S. Sequences of three. Because that is exactly how DNA sequences out letters that make words, that make proteins, that make every living creature in the world. Everything. So, uses these four base pairs. And the way, let's say, let me show you what it looks like. That's the book. That's the book. And if you know how to read the code, and scientists now are so good at reading the code that now they know how to rewrite the code. That's how good they've gotten at it. That's dangerous, but that's how... that's. And what God did was God made it easy. Instead of making DNA an untranslatable code book, God made it simple. Because you see the letters up there, C, A, T, and G. Well, that's adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. So every time the adenine joins with the thymine, that's a, that's a part of the code. And then the next rung, let's say it would be guanine make, connecting with cytosine and then guanine with cytosine again. So what they figured out was for every three of these base connections, every three of these makes a genetic letter. Okay, so let me show it to you. So let's say that your body needs more let's say your body needs more spit okay we don't thank god we don't have to drink spit in order to get spit <laughs> our body makes it but it needs it needs water and proteins to make it spit actually is not just water it's got stuff in it that helps dissolve and break down the food that we eat that's what it's for and for making people really mad when you go like that okay but see the body's got to make and so when you get when you get a cotton mouth your mouth gets real dry the the body's got to make more spit so what it does it reads all of the billions of base pair combinations until it finds the place the book and the chapter where the recipe is for making the proteins that make spit. And it reads off these three combinations of base pairs. So let's say G, C, and A will make the letter A, make a protein. A, G, A will make another letter, which is another protein. G, guanine, adenine, thymine will make another letter. Adenine, adenine, thymine will make another letter. So it's just like the letters that we draw on the page, there's about three strokes that we can make on the page that make the letters that we write down. Okay? And it just so happens that the letters of DNA, the number is 22. Exactly. The Hebrew alphabet that made the words of your Bible is 22 letters. So when David said, in thy book, all my members were written... How did he know that 3,000 years before the scientists figured it out? The Holy Ghost told him because God wrote that book. And what this is all about is, God, for everything that your body is and it needs, the DNA has the recipe for, number one, making the proteins. Number two, then the recipe for folding the proteins the right way. And then number three, for binding the proteins together to make the parts of your body that you need to make the spit that you need. But it all boils down to the combination of the three working together as one to make the letters that make the words that make the book of your DNA code. Everything that we learn about this creation tells us that it couldn't have been an accident. No way, no how. And everything that we see about it tells us that the entity that made it must have a special and unique relationship with the number three. The Father, the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Even in Genesis 1, where God's going to make man, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Three. And everywhere you look, 
That number is there. It's present. It's because it's the number that pertains to life. But with everything that God does with a number, Satan does the exact opposite. So on God's side, the number three represents life, resurrection, the gift of life. But when Satan's got it, he corrupts it. And what God means for life, Satan means for death. So we get back to what God created on day three of creation. He created grass, he created herb yielding seed, and he created trues, trees bearing fruit. So then God puts two trees in the midst of the garden. And then Satan comes down in Genesis 3. And he gets in with Eve, and Satan's job is to try to draw Eve away from the tree of life. To get her to choose the tree that God said, don't eat of that tree. And that's what happened. That's why you and I have to come to church. And read our Bibles and pray and ask God forgiveness. That's why we need salvation. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need the cross. Okay? To defeat what Satan brought into this earth by way of temptation. Okay? So, uh, turn very quickly. 1 Corinthians 15. We'll end here. We'll pick it up next Sunday. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul then explains what it is is one of the core doctrines of Christianity. Verse 35. Some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? And it's a good question. It's a legitimate question. So, verse 36. Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened. The word quickened means made alive. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. So, when you pull the husk of corn off the corn stalk... That corn on there is real nice and juicy and wet and it's alive. But you let it sit out and what happens to it? it dries up and dies. And then you make popcorn. Or you can wait. Pull those seeds off and wait till next spring. Because on that one stalk, how many seeds did you plant to get all of that corn off of one stalk? You just put one seed in the ground, but what happened? It multiplied. Ain't God good? And instead of just, when you plant one seed in, instead of you just getting one seed out, you get way more than one seed. It's that way with everything. Especially rabbits. Amen. <laughs> they multiply, amen. And puppies sometimes. But anyway. So... And what you put in the ground and what comes out of the ground are two entirely different things. They don't look like each other, do they? So that's, that's what he's saying here. Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quicken except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. By the way, there's something unique about wheat. I read an article this last week, somebody sent it to me, that it's, they've actually, they've been, they were able 20 years ago to sequence the human genome because human, the human DNA has 3 billion base pair connections. They've been trying to sequence wheat for years now because for some reason... Wheat has some, something like 200 billion base pair connections. Something as simple as wheat, and yet it is far more complex than what even the human body is. I, I'm wanting to know that one. I want to know more about that. Because wheat is what the good seed was that went into the ground, but the enemy came and sowed tares. Remember that? But the idea was... 
that what you put in the ground does not look like what's coming up out of the ground. So there's hope for all of us ugly people that once we die, we're not going to be ugly no more. Because what God brings up out of that ground is going to be far better than what was put in the ground, far greater. Think about Jesus used the parable of the mustard seed. How big is a mustard seed? That big. And yet, what tree does it make? It's amazingly huge. So he says, verse 38, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So next Sunday night, we're going to carry this forward, and we're going to talk about this theme of the seed and the Word of God. And how, how I ever... was brought to the place where I asked Jesus into my heart. It wasn't by a ritual that was done on me. It wasn't by way of some magic spell that was cast. It was the seed of the Word of God in me that made me what I am by the grace of God. Amen? Father, we've enjoyed your word tonight. And I thank you for it. And Lord, there's f far more in here, Lord, that I don't know versus what I do know. And Lord, I love the search. I love seeking it out. And I pray, dear God, that you would draw me even more so into a full desire of wanting to know what else this Bible has to say. Father, I pray God that the word that's gone out to these people, Lord, would remain in them and bring forth fruit down the road. Your, your grace, your blessing in their life manifested by what was sown as far as the word of God in their hearts today. Father, thank you, Lord, for sending some good people our way. I pray that you'd bless them. Bless those that are visiting with us and joining with us online. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for, once again for this book. Teach us, Father, we're never, we're never going to get too old, never going to get too smart to learn one more thing about your Bible. So, Father, teach us. Mold us in your image, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming.